Thank you so much for joining us today. Pastor Randy has a wonderful word. I'm ready to receive it. Are you ready to receive it? If you love the word that Pastor Randy is giving us today, please give us a thumbs up. Also, please consider sewing into Impact Community Church. You can do so on our website at www.impactcc.org. Have a blessed day. This is the last week of this sermon series. I thank God for this sermon series. Amen. Amen. I pray that it has blessed your heart. Uh, I pray that you have seen something in Psalms chapter 23 that you had not seen prior to us spending six to seven weeks to go over what the Bible says in Psalms chapter 23. That I said when we opened up this sermon series that Psalms chapter 23 is more than just a funeral scripture. Amen. There's life in it. Amen. There's life in it. So this morning, if you will allow me, we're going to close this sermon series and, and we're going to have some fun in the Lord this morning because there's nobody like God. Amen. He's the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. Amen. He is the good shepherd. Amen. Amen. He leads us. He guides us. He's, he's the one. Amen. So if you don't mind, we'll stand on our feet for the reading of God's word. It's six powerful but yet short verses of scripture that I just want to read this morning. Amen. And we'll spend the majority of our time on verse 6. Amen. Because we're closing it out. The Bible says this in verse 1. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I can't hear y'all. Yea, though I walk, that now I hear y'all. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Amen. Hallelujah. While we're standing, Father, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word today, God. We thank you for blessing us just to be here this morning. We thank you for what you have in store for us, oh God. It's no more I, but it's the Christ that lives within us today, God. We thank you that as your word goes forth, it hits the hearts and minds of those who are here today, causing increase in their life, God. We didn't come for form or fashion this morning. We didn't come to see or be seen today, God. We've come to worship you. We've come to acknowledge you. We've come to hallow your name this morning because you are the one true and living God today, Lord. We thank you for the surety of your word. We know that it changes lives. You said that heaven and earth would pass away before your word would today, God. And we just thank you for all you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord this morning. What I love about Psalms chapter 23 is that it's a promise to us. Say promise. And one thing I love about scripture and one thing that I love about God is that if God makes you a promise, he's a promise keeper. Amen. Amen. And so the Bible says this. Let me lay a little foundation. Numbers chapter 23, the Bible says this, verse 19. It says, God is not a man that he should lie, 
neither the son of man that he should repent or change his mind. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Whatever God says he will do, he will do it. It says, or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? In the NLT, the Bible says, God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? God is a promise keeper. Amen. When we look at Psalms chapter 23, verse 6 this morning, I want you to realize that God is a promise keeper. He does what he says he's going to to do. He's not like anybody you have ever met in your life who has made you a promise and then they reneged. God is a God that if he makes you a promise, he follows through. That's what I love about him. He is a promise keeper. God has made me some promises and he has seen every one of those promises through. The Bible says in the book of Jeremiah that he follows his word to perform it. So if God gives you a word, he's going to follow his word to make sure that it comes to pass in your life. There are sometimes that even when we don't do what we're supposed to do, the word is still there wanting to work on our behalf. I wish I had an amen in the house this morning. And so that is the type of God that we serve. So when you read scripture and there's a promise for anybody, there's a promise for you. Because if God did it for them, them, God can do it for you because God is not a man that he should lie. So we don't compare him to mother, father, sister, brother, even our best friend who will tell us something and they will not perform it. In some cases, they don't have the ability to perform it. But God is never lacking ability. He's never lacking power. In the Greek, dunamis, God does not, uh, he doesn't lack power. Some people tell you something, and when they tell you, you know they don't have the ability to do it. But when God tells you something, you know that he has the ability, the power, the dunamis to follow it through. That's what I love about him. Amen. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 18, it says that by two immutable things in that it was impossible for God to lie. He can't do it. Jesus said that the spirit of truth will come and he will teach you all things that I, that I, he will bring back to remembrance everything that I've told you. God is 100% true, so therefore there's no lie in him. There's no space in him for a lie because anything that he says comes to pass. God is the only one who can come into a dark place and speak light and then light comes. Y'all don't want to talk to me. God is the only one that can go to a place where there was no clouds, there was no sun, there was no moon. And he could speak a word and then there is a sun and there is a moon and there is a cloud. Because anything that he says comes to pass, which is why he cannot lie. Y'all will get that one when you get home. You'll get that one when you get home. Notice this, that if anything you said come to pass then that means you don't have the ability to lie because whatever you say is true. It comes to pass. Oh, that's a teaching all by itself. So, so the Bible says this, verse 6. It says, surely, say surely. Surely comes from the Hebrew word ah. It means surely. It means nevertheless or only. It is a contrast between different ideas or actions, and that is in the English language how we use the word nevertheless. All of this is going on in my life, nevertheless. See, Jesus told the disciples, he said, cast the net on the other side. And they said, we fished all night, but nevertheless, at your word, we'll cast the net. And so it does not make any difference what's going on in your life if God is giving you a word. The, the world could be stacked up against you, but if God has given you a word, then you are like the disciples. You say, nevertheless, nevertheless. Say, surely, surely. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. And actually, when I take a step back and I put all of the things that are happening bad in my life on a scale and I put 
everything that's going on good in my life on another scale, it seems like the scale that has all of the bad weighs more than the scale that has all of the good, but that's because we haven't factored in God. Because when God is in your life, he's the one who knows how to balance the scales in your life because he is the surely, surely. How do you know it's going to work out? I don't know how it's going to work out. I just know that God said it's going to work out. Somebody say surely. When David lived his life, he got to the end of Psalms chapter 23 and he said, I don't know much, but he said like surely, surely. Nevertheless, after all I've been through, somebody said, I still have joy. Nevertheless, after everything that I've been through, God has not failed me. He has not let me down. He has been there for me. Greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. Surely, 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 surely. Surely God's going to get some glory out of what's going on right now. Surely, 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 I can't explain it. If you asked me to explain it, I couldn't explain it. If you ask me why I'm so happy, I can't tell you why I'm happy. I just know surely, surely, nevertheless, only, 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 I just know God is going to work it out. Turn to your neighbor and say, God will work it out. David said, just as sure as I am here today and just as sure as God is God, he's going to work it out. How, how do you know he's going to work it out? I, I just, I just know, I just I, I've spent enough time with God until I just, I just know. I just know. So it don't even make sense to me because when I look at the scales, it doesn't look like they are lining up in my favor. The only thing I have is a promise. And God is not a man that he should lie. That's all I got. Can I tell you the truth? That's all any of us have. Because until you see the manifestation of what God has done, all you have is a promise. But for God to make a promise is different than somebody else making a promise because he has the power to back up everything that he says. So, so this morning, I don't have three points. I know y'all going to be so disappointed. Pastor Randy don't have three points. We're just going to let the scriptures speak this morning. Is, is that okay? We're just going to let the scriptures do all of the talking because there's enough need in the scriptures that will feed you without my three points this morning. And tell the truth, I, I kind of feel uncomfortable because I don't have my three points this morning. But, but all I got is one verse of scripture. Surely. That, that's, that's, that's all, just, just surely, that's it. Late in the midnight hour, all I got is surely. When people don't treat me good at work, I just, all I got is surely. Because the Bible says you stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So all I got is a surely, nevertheless, I'm going to keep doing what God called me to do. Nevertheless, I'm still going to bless you when you want to curse me. Nevertheless, I'm still going to pray for you when you want to despitefully use me. Nevertheless, because I believe in the word so much until it encourages me just to continue doing what I'm doing. And how you hate me don't affect me. Oh, I better, I got I to gotta move on. I got to move on. Say, surely. The Bible says this, verse 6, it says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. This is how David could say, surely. Oh, God. Goodness comes from the word tob. Say tob. And it means pleasant. It means agreeable. It means good. Goodness is pleasant, agreeable. It means good. That at the end, it may not be while you're going through, but at the end, his goodness will show up. And it's going to be pleasant to you. 
it's going to be pleasant to your taste. It's going to be pleasant to your feel. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. So the goodness of the Lord will show up. It'll show up in the land of the living. And you will be blessed like you never thought you'd be blessed before because God's goodness, his favor is there. David said, I don't spend the time in my life that God's goodness has not been there. Remember, when we opened up this sermon series, we talked about Psalms chapter 23 and when it was written. It wasn't written when David was younger. It was written when David was older, when he looked back over his life and he said, God, you have been good to me. See, a novice, a novice can't say, God, you've been good to me when you look back over your life. But when David looked back over his life, how many people in here are as old as I am? Y'all don't want to talk to me. That, that when you look back over your life, you look back over your life in 2010 and 2000, 1990, 1980, 1970, 1960, 1950. God bless you. And you say... God, you've been, you've been good. You've been better than good. I can't praise you enough. I owe you my life that you have been good. You, you've been the toll. You've been pleasant to me. And even when I was going through difficult things, by the end, it still agreed with me. That at the end, you still got a praise out of me. That, that even though I did not want to give you a praise mentally, my spirit wanted to give you a praise. And it came through my soul that I just wanted to tell you that you have been good. Say goodness. God's goodness is here. And when you think about the person who wrote this, it was the goodness of God. David was destined to be king but when the Samuel the prophet came to anoint him king and he went to his daddy Jesse and said bring all of your sons here Jesse didn't even have the thought to bring David sure he brought Eliab and he brought Abinadab and he brought Shammah and, 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 and Samuel is there getting ready to pour out the oil and he's looking at Jesse and he's like something's wrong because the oil don't want to come out Oh, side note, side note, that nobody can get what God has promised for you, right? So, 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 so you don't have to get mad at people being jealous of you, being envious of you. You don't have to get mad thinking like I'm not at the right place and, and they're going to get it because the oil won't come out until you get there. Y'all don't want to talk to me this morning. He said, you anoint my head with oil and my cup runneth over. That's what he's talking about. So, so the prophet says, do you have anybody else? Something's wrong because I know God sent me here to anoint the king and this oil is stopped up. It's like it's a cork here and it don't want to come out. And then Jesse's father says, oh yeah, we got another son. And he's keeping the sheep. So they call David in. David comes running in. The Bible says he's handsome, he looks good. And then the scripture also says that God is not a person that looks on the outward. He looks on the inside. And the oil flowed and flowed and flowed and flowed and flowed. And David was anointed to be king even though he wasn't walking in kingship. You can be anointed for something and not walk in it until later. You're like, well, I don't know if God is anointing me. No, no, no. He can anoint you today, but you're not in that position until later. Is it making sense? Say goodness. Say goodness. It's the tobe of the Lord. Sometimes you need goodness. You need some goodness. When you do the right thing and suffer the wrong consequences, you need goodness. This is David. David went to fight Goliath. He killed Goliath. That was the right thing. He represented his family well. He represented his father well. He represented his brothers well. He represented his king well. He represented the kingdom well. 
So his victory wasn't a victory just for him. His victory was a victory for his family. His victory was a victory for all of the families that were represented. Right? Because all of the husbands and the uncles and the grandfathers, they don't have to go off to war now because he, defi he defeated Goliath. And remember, what the, 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 the agreement was is that if David beats Goliath, then the Israelites win. And if Goliath beats the children of Israel, then the Philistines win. So when he beat Goliath, they won. You would think he would be celebrated and loved by all. He did the right thing, but he found out he still needed goodness because sometimes you can do the right thing and people get jealous. Oh, y'all don't want to say amen to that. You can do the right thing and people get envious. You can do the right thing and people still start, still keep talking about you. You can show love and they show hate. You can give and they get mad. You can testify about what God has done and they still get upset with you. Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. So the very one that should have been the happiest, King Saul, for what David had done became the most envious. And got mad at him. It's making sense. Say goodness. You need goodness. You may not know you need goodness because sometimes you don't recognize goodness until almost the end of the journey. But if you're smart enough, you'll recognize goodness now. I'm going to show my maps. I, I hope you can see this. You, yeah, I'm going to take you to school right quick. I'm going to take you to school right quick, right quick. Hold on. We're going to go to school, right? And so... This is a map that I had found that represents David running from King Saul. And we're going to take it one map at a time. We're going to go through them pretty fast, so you might not have time to take a picture. But, but put my first one up, because I want you just to pay attention to the green, right? So from Ramah to Gibeah, right? You see the green up there? Go back. See the green up there? 1 Samuel 19, that's your reference. Next slide. So he goes from there, and now he's going down to Nob, 1 Samuel 21. Then he goes to Gath, right, 1 Samuel chapter 21. Gath is the home of the Philistines. David ran from Saul to the point that he ran over into the enemy's territory to get away from Saul. Does this make sense? Gath, remember, Goliath was from Gath, right? So next slide, then he goes to Adullam, the cave of Adullam, right, 1 Samuel chapter 22. Then he goes all the way to Mitzvah. He's running. Because the person that he just won the battle for now is envious and he wants to kill him. Say, keep running. Keep running. Keep running. But anyway, so, so then he goes back up. My next slide. Then he goes back up, 1 Samuel chapter 23. And we end in, in Gedi. Do you know some Bible scholars say that David was on the run between 8 and 15 years of his life? You've gone through some things, but I don't know if you've been running from 8 to 15 years where someone who has an army, they are out to kill you because they are jealous of you. And they're jealous of you because you did something good. I don't know if you've had hatred that way before where people just hate you and after a while they just hate you because they hate you because they forgot about what you did they just they just hate you and now you're on the run for almost 15 years 15 good years of your life where you look back at God and say I wonder what I could have accomplished if I wasn't on the run and all I did was something good and now he's running and running and in caves and, and, and without it. And he's like, God, I, I seem like I don't worship you the way I used to because I'm running. And I'm talking to, to every parent that's got some middle school kids that, that got some high school kids and they can't drive. All the parents seem like they're just running. Y'all don't want to talk to me. 
That's why you're almost falling asleep in church, because you, you're just running. Wake up at 6, and you take the kids to school, and you have to go pick them up from school because the school that you send them to is not in your district. And you go to work, and you get off work, and you got to do homework. And, and then you have to make sure they're showered, and they go to bed, and you feed them some food. And before you know it, you woke up at 5.30 or 6, and now it's 9 o'clock at night, and you've been running in the name of good. In the name of good. And you have a freshman and they want to play basketball and they want to play soccer and they can't drive yet. And you want them to get out there and you're like, uh, how old are you again? They're like, mama, you know how old I am. Do you, can you find a friend? All in the name of good. And now it's, school is starting and it's, parent-teacher conference and introduction. I want to get to know you. You're like, I really need to get this thing done at work. And, but, but, you know, I, I mean, I want them to know you got a daddy in your life. So that means now I got to show up, even though I'm tired and really don't want to be there because that's, that's what runners do in the name of good. Is this making sense? But the thing about goodness is that goodness is not by itself because he says surely goodness and mercy and that's what I love as much as I love goodness I really love mercy because some people will persecute you for doing something good but sometimes we need mercy because of the things we've done y'all don't want to y'all don't want to talk to me this morning so, so it's easy when we go to God and we say, God, I just need your goodness because what I did was good and now I'm suffering wrong, as opposed to saying, God, I need your mercy because you told me not to do it and I ended up doing it. So please give me your mercy. Have mercy on me because what I am bearing in my body based on the consequences are the consequences to my actions. Y'all don't want to talk to me this morning. Y'all don't want to talk to me this morning. I've got two people that are going to help me this morning. And, and, and just, just, just so you'll know, one of, the, one of them's name is goodness. And one of them's name is mercy. Let's, let's, let's. And so... I'm going to drive the cameraman crazy. They're going like, oh. So wherever you go in life, there are two people that God has sent for you that wherever you go, they go. Is this making sense? So, so as you go through life, you never go alone. You always go with some help. Is this making sense? So, so when things are good and you do good, sometimes people still act, I don't want to use that word, I don't want to use, they still act badly towards you, and, and sometimes you need a little bit of goodness. Sometimes when you don't know which way to go, goodness will, goodness will tell you which way to go. Is this making sense? So you don't have to go through life And sometimes, you know, because this sermon series is the good shepherd. Amen. What I love about goodness and mercy is that goodness and mercy follows you, uh -huh. even though sometimes you don't follow the good shepherd. Y'all right. don't want to talk to me. Because sometimes we get diverted from the course that God would have us to be on. And so if the good shepherd is over there and we find ourselves over here, goodness and mercy doesn't abandon you to go follow the good shepherd, although they could, they still decide to follow you. So, so sometimes when we are going through consequences because of the actions that we have taken, sometimes it takes us down to our knees. Like, God, I don't know how, how I got here, but goodness and mercy are so good until they'll lift you back up to get you back on the path 
that you need to be on. Say goodness. Say mercy. Say goodness. Say mercy. And notice this. They shall follow me. Follow. Put my scripture up. They'll follow me. Right? And follow comes from the Hebrew word radah. And it means to pursue. It means to chase. It means to persecute. Persecute in the sense that I'm going to follow you so much until I'm going to catch you. So you can't outrun goodness and mercy. Y'all don't want to talk to me. And, and even when you did not do what God called you to do, he still gave you some help. See, because they follow you whether you go to jail. Oh, y'all don't want to talk to me. They, they follow you in and out of divorce. They, they, they follow you when you're having problems with your kids because they said something and you didn't respond the right way. You let out one of those words that you said you had been delivered from. They follow you through your temper tantrums. They follow you through your quiet seasons when everybody asks you what's wrong and you ain't, ain't nothing wrong with me. And they're like, no, something is wrong with, something is wrong with you. Even though you have diverted from the path, they still following you. So they are the words, they bring the words that say, you need to get back over there. You, you need to get back. You need to stop acting like that. You need to stop behaving that way. You, you, you need to do better. Am I preaching to myself? Or has anyone ever heard a voice saying like, you need to do better? And here's the deal. By the mere fact that you hear the voice saying, you need to do better, you know it's not your voice. You need to do better and then you say, yeah, I need to do better. That's goodness and that's mercy. When you want to go to the club and the good shepherd didn't lead you to the club. And then they start shooting in the club. And you're like, oh, Lord, I thank God for goodness. I thank God for mercy. And you said, Lord, if you just get me out of here this way, if you get me out tonight, I will never, ever, ever, ever in a million years go back. Y'all don't want to talk to me this morning. Hey, have you ever been running and you found yourself running into some place that you shouldn't have been running into? Or you wake up in the morning and you said, man, I shouldn't have came over. Oh, I'm going to leave that alone. I'm, 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 I'm going to leave that one alone. Like, I, I shouldn't have. I'm done. Thank you. I, I shouldn't have. He, he looked nice. She looked nice. I know I shouldn't have went over there, but. Lord, I need your mercy. Your grace and mercy have brought me. In fact, I'm living this moment. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me. Even when I don't follow the good shepherd that God still has a blessing in it for me. It may not have been the best blessing. Because remember, the person who is writing this needed mercy. So he had goodness. God gave him goodness because he was persecuted over something that he did that was good. But this is the same man, the Bible says, that one night he was on his rooftop and he looked over the king's palace and he saw a lady that was bathing and he, he summoned her to come and, and then he had sex with her and then she became pregnant and, and, and he needed some mercy. So the one who had experienced goodness in his life, now he goes to God saying, God, I need your, your mercy. Because then we see in scripture one of the most diabolical devilish acts ever in scripture. He sent a note with his commander saying, I want you to put Uriah on the front line in the fiercest part of the battle, and then I want you to tell all the troops to withdraw from him, ensuring that he's going to, to die because of all of the stuff that he's done. So David knew what it was like to have goodness, but he also knew what it was like mercy Amen. to have mercy God tried to talk with him he didn't want to talk with him the child that they had together 
You know the story. The child died, even though David was fasting and praying. Finally, almost nine or ten months later, God sends the prophet and gives him a little story and says, there was one man that had a lot of lambs. And then there was one man that only had one ewe lamb. And the man that had a lot of lambs took the one lamb that the one man had and David blew up and said, he needs to die. Because after all, how can you as a person who has a lot of lambs take only one lamb from somebody who only has one and then the prophet said in in 21st century vernacular you the man he said that's you and it brought David his knees like I need mercy I don't know about you but there have been times in my life I've said the wrong thing, done the wrong thing, thought the wrong thing, behaved unseemingly, and I'm like, God, I need your mercy. And I can tell God is working on me. I can tell God is working on me. Last week, we went to one of our favorite fast food places because we like their Frosties. Frosties were a dollar. Frosties were a dollar. I don't know if you caught in, caught on that. And we went there, and out of all the locations we went to, we went to the one, and the lady said, the Frosty machine. Back in the day, back in the day, I would have went like, cuckoo. I drove all this way and this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. Let me speak to a manager. Somebody's going to do something for me. But I was so good, wasn't I? I just said, well, thank you. And Tarsha was like. <laughs> because I've had the propensity in the past to, to show out at the drive through I remember I showed out at the drive through one time, not knowing who was on the other side of the speaker. And when I got to the window, it was someone from church. And they said, hey, Pastor Randy. And I was like, Ooh. Thank God for mercy. Thank God for mercy. Thank God for mercy. Surely, goodness and mercy shall redolph me, follow me all the days of my life. Let me finish this. And this is what David says. He says, follow me all the days of my life. Put up the next verse. And he says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He says, God, if you could just get me back to a place where I could worship you. He says, I'll never leave. You've showed me goodness. You've showed me mercy. I've been running over the countryside for almost 15 years. I haven't had the opportunity to go into the temple and worship you because there were no temples out there. I slept in caves. I slept in the dirt. I slept in places that I didn't even know if it was safe. He said, but if you can just get me back to the place where I could come into the house of the Lord. Now it makes sense because when he said, I'd rather just be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. He said, if you could just get me back to church. Do you know that David was so creative and he, until he created instruments? Some of the people, the, the Levites and, and the priests, they, the, they played instruments that David had made. 
When we read the book of Psalms, those were actually songs. And he was like, God, I just want to worship you. And I want to worship you in the place that you have created. Is this making sense? Put my point up, my first point. David had been on the run all his life. Some people run so hard now until you don't even have time to come to church. Just keep looking straight. Nobody knows you. No, matter of fact, I'm talking to my online, the online audience. I'm talking to the online audience that sometimes we run so hard even doing the good things until we don't have an opportunity to come to the place with other believers just to hallow the name of God. David missed that. He missed the connection out of all of the luxuries and amenities that a king would have. He said, one thing I just like doing, I just like going to church. Especially for someone who wanted to go and could not go. If you don't know the value of coming into a worship service, wait until you're in a hospital and you want to go and you can't go. Y'all don't want to talk to me. And so David said, I am so glad. He said, I just want to get back to where I can go in and worship. I want to play my little harp. I want to do what I've done before. Because remember, this was the man that his own wife despised him for praising God. Remember, she, she scorned him, saying like, oh, the king has totally humiliated himself today. That was the relationship he had with God. He believed it was a privilege to worship God and enjoy his presence. Out of all of the luxuries a king could have, the top priority for David wasn't another chariot with some gold spinners on it, some 22s. It wasn't another chariot or the fastest horse. It was like... If I could just get into, remember, this is the person who wanted to build God a house. And God wouldn't allow him to build him a house. But he thought more about God than he did about himself. He thought more about God's house than he thought about his house. He said, I just want to dwell. Dwell means to sit. It means to remain. For some of us, God has done so much for us until we just said like, hey, I just want to just, I just want to just sit here. Y'all don't want to talk to me in here this morning. For all that you have done, I just want to sit in your presence. First of all, I want to tell you thank you. But if I don't say anything other than that, I just want to be, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord. I remember as a a new believer and as a a new preacher, a new pastor, sometimes, because, you know, back then I had keys to the church. I would go in when nobody else was there, and I would just sit on the pulpit. I would lay down on the pulpit. I would just bask in the glory of the Lord until someone saw my car there and they came knocking on the church door. And I'm like, leave me alone. I just want to be in here with God. Because God can bless you with money, but his money is not his presence. God can bless you with another house, but his house is not his presence. God can bless you with another job, but the job comes short of his presence. No wonder David said, I was glad when they said unto me. Let us not go to a restaurant. Let us not go to the family reunion. Let us not go here. Let us not. He said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. He said, one thing I desire, and this will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, that I will inquire in his gates and in his beauty because I just want to be where he is. And he said, from where I've come from, 
Dwelling in the house of the Lord is the best thing that ever happened to me. Sometimes you get tired of running. Sometimes you get tired of faking it. Sometimes you get tired of playing that things are all right and they really aren't all right. And sometimes you get tired of trying to work out things on your own. David said, if I could just get to the house of the Lord. Can I tell you a little bit about my experience being a Christian? My experience being a Christian is this. This is my testimony with God. Every single time I have come to the house of the Lord, especially on a Sunday morning, I have left better than when I came in. That's my testimony. And if I did not leave better, it was because I was bitter about something and I did not worship God and receive what God had for me that day. Other than that, every time I've come into the house of the Lord, I've left better. Someone smiled, someone said something, someone sang a verse, the preacher preached, something happened and I left better. We have come to the house of the Lord and pulled up on the parking lot and not talked to one another. And then when church was over, I said, want to get something to eat? That's my way of apologizing. She, she had to find out that was my way of saying I'm sorry. I'm like, uh, I would start with that and I eventually I would say I was sorry, but that's how the apology started. But that's a lot better than pulling up on the church parking lot going to teach Sunday school and you hadn't said anything to your wife all week. So when I say I love going to God's house and sometimes the worship in God's house brings tears to my eyes. Tears to my eyes is like a refreshing and washing of my soul that I finally get to a place where I can lay my burdens down. David said, I'm tired of running. I'm tired of the torment of all the things that I've done. I'm tired of all of the thoughts that I've had. He said, if I could just get back to the house of the Lord. He said, I want to dwell there, not just on a Sunday. He said, I want to dwell there forever. Two things, and I'll tell you, and we'll head out. Forever. Forever means as long as I'm living, God, you will always have my time, right? Because when you think about it, showing up at 10.30, leaving at 12, it's only an hour and a half, but it does so much for you throughout the week. So David said, I don't know how long I'm going to be in the temple today, but if I can just get there, it's going to be good for me all the days of my life. And then he knew this that there would be a time that he would no longer be on the earth, but he could still dwell in the temple. See, there will be a day that we'll go to a temple not made by earthly hands. Y'all don't want to talk to me. There will be a day that you are no longer living in the house that you live in now, living in the apartment that you live in now. There will be a day that you will be able to worship So when David said, surely goodness and mercy follows me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, he's saying, while I'm on earth and when I get to heaven, I'm going to dwell in the presence of the Lord forever. We'll stand on our feet. You're like, Lord, I am tired of running. I do need a change. I thought a change of scenery would be good for me, but nothing is as good as a house of the Lord. There have been sometimes I've gone to church, and even as a pastor, the sermon that went forth from the pulpit, it was for me. So I would go to the altar and people thought I was coming down on the floor to pray with people. I'm like, no, I'm coming to the altar because I need some help. 
you know, for, for someone who's married and doesn't speak to their spouse for several days because you're throwing a temper tantrum and you're immature and acting childish, you need some, you need some help. Because if what she's saying doesn't get through, then you need somebody who can say something that will get through to you. So I know what it's like to say on a Thursday, I can't wait to get to church. Because this ain't working. I know what it's like on Friday morning saying, I can't wait. You're like, God, I'm so sorry. But I don't know how to I don't know how to change. And I got tired of running and running and running and running and doing things that I said I was delivered from. And saying things that I said would never come out of my mouth again. I'm like, God, I just need some help. Hey, we want to thank you for watching our broadcast today. We hope that something was said that would give you encouragement, something that will help you strengthen your walk with Jesus Christ. Our goal is to cover the entire earth with the knowledge of Jesus Christ. If this message has been a blessing to you, just let us know. Leave us a comment in the line. Give us a thumbs up. And so until the next time, God bless you.